What's going on? Welcome to our next lecture video on the other senses. So we had two on vision. We had one on hearing. Those are the important ones. Today we're going to talk about all the other senses for part of the unit on sensation and perception. In our next video, we'll talk about perception, the other piece of the unit. Uh, hopefully you have had a good fall break, depending on when you are watching this. We're going to talk about one, two, three, four, five, six different senses today. We'll have one Roman numeral on each. So let's start off with the vestibular sense. Now, when you're writing down vestibular, I encourage you to underline the B-L-A in vestibular, because for me, it reminds me of the B-L-A in balance. Your vestibular sense is your whole body's sense of balance, orientation, okay? Um, so you may not know this, but it is your ears that are in charge of your balance. So if you know someone who's had an ear infection, sometimes that can lead to dizziness, which seems strange. We think of our ear as only being about hearing, right? You have the, the cochlea down here, that important part of the ear where transduction happens on the basilar membrane, the hair cells, place theory, frequency theory, right? So we think about hearing, but in the ear, you also have what are called the semicircular canals. They're called this because they look like half circles, semicircles, they look like loops. And these canals, there are three of them, they're in charge of your dizziness, your orientation, your balance, okay? Here's how they work, okay? Uh, and I'll come back to that point. But when you shake your head from left to right, there's one semicircular canal, okay, the horizontal canal that is filled with liquid. And when that liquid sloshes back and forth this way, your brain knows that your body, your head, are moving back and forth. You have another one called the superior canal. Liquid is sloshing up and down in this canal, and that lets your brain know what's going on with your body. You also have one, if you tilt your head to the left, you tilt your head to the right, there's one that's kind of at an angle. It's called the posterior canal, posterior canal, and it is in charge of knowing are you at an angle or not, okay? So all of these senses work with the cerebellum, which is in charge of balance and movement. And this is also where procedural memory, those muscle memories come into play for things that involve your whole body's orientation and balance. So again, your vestibular sense. It's about your whole body. And the reason why I keep emphasizing whole body is because Roman numeral number two, the kinesthetic sense, kin, K-I-N, always means movement. So my people who are in physics, you know, Kinetic has to do with movement. Um, if you measure in kinesthesiology, you're studying movement of specific body parts, muscles and joints and, and bones, right? So vestibular is your whole body's balance in the ear. Kinesthetic sense works very closely with the vestibular, but it's about where specific body parts are. I want to do a little test here. Test your kinesthetic sense. I want you to take your two fingers and try and bring them together so they touch, all right? Start far apart, bring them together so they touch. Start way out wide, bring them together so they touch, okay? Pretty good. See how fast you can bring them together and see if you can get your fingertips to touch perfectly, okay? And if you're like, Mr. Jones, I am an expert at this, all right? I want you to do step two. I want you to close your eyes and try to bring them together so your fingertips touch. I missed. Try again. Fingertips together. Still a little bit off. If you're like, Mr. Jones, I'm great at this. I nailed it first try. Then I want you to try doing it behind your back. Okay? So start out wide and bring them together and see if you can get your fingertips to touch perfectly. I would be surprised if you can get them perfectly quickly out wide with your eyes open, close together with your eyes closed, and if you can do it behind your back perfectly. If you can, it means you have amazing kinesthetic sense. So these receptors for this sense are found in the joints and muscles in the skeletal system, and they let your brain know what your body is doing at all times. So on the right here, they ask this person to maybe hold one arm out at a 45 degree angle and one arm out at a 30 degree angle. And it's basically how aware are you of the very specific body parts movements. Vestibular, whole body balance, dizziness, upside down. Kinesthetic, what are specific body parts doing? 
number three, touch. So what organ is the largest sense organ in the body? It's a fun little trivia question, Jeopardy question. It's not the eye or the nose or the ear or the tongue. The largest sense organ in your body is your skin. Your skin is a sense organ, okay? It connects just like the ear and the eye. It connects to that somatosensory cortex. So underneath the surface here, this is kind of a cross-section image of the skin. I know it's hard to see, but it says you have pain receptors and touch receptors and pressure receptors and temperature receptors. The skin is where you feel cold or warm, whether you feel touch, pressure, and it's also where you can feel pain, okay? Now, are all parts of the skin equally sensitive? Of course not, right? Um, if, if you're going to get a paper cut or if you're gonna um, scrape some part of your skin, you're probably okay with scraping your elbow or scraping your knee, not that big a deal. Now, if I said that we're gonna give you a paper cut or scrape or cut a fingertip, oh, ah, that sounds painful. There are other parts of the body where you, are, you know they're a little more sensitive than others and you don't wanna get that, have you ever bit your lip before or the inside of your cheek? Oh, that's so painful different parts of the body have different levels of sensitivity, okay? Which um, brings us to my friend, Mr. Homunculus. We'll look at him more in class. But this thing is a representation of which parts of the body are most sensitive. So this is like a human anatomy, but it is in proportion based on what is most sensitive. So what parts of the body are most sensitive, have the most sensitivity receptors? Well, the fingertips and the hand have to be incredibly sensitive. Also, the lips and the tongue are in charge of keeping you alive. The eye, the ear, those parts of the body are also pretty sensitive. What's not that sensitive? Look at these scrawny little elbows, scrawny little legs. Those parts of the body are not as sensitive, okay? Another way of looking at Mr. Homunculus, I encourage you to write that word down. Say it's fun, homunculus. It's the representation of which parts of your body are most sensitive. And now what we have here is the sensory cortex, right? Up, not in the frontal lobe, that's where the motor cortex is in charge of your movement, but the, what's the lobe in the very top of your brain? Parietal, right? It's in charge of, I said pain, but it's also in charge of feeling and sensations. So can you see this? Let's try something out. Ooh. Look at the technology here. Oh yeah, fantastic. So you have parts of the sensory cortex that are responsible for very specific areas of the body, okay? The hand gets a ton of space in your sensory cortex, okay? Arm, wrist, hand, all these little fingers, more of your sensory cortex is dedicated to one finger than to your elbow. One finger than all of the senses in your entire arm. Okay, um, there are other parts here, um, and, and this is kind of mapped out. So um, there, there's overlap. There's some instances of people who their brain wiring gets mixed up. So something that, that they would normally feel in one part of their body, they feel it in other parts of their body, which can be interesting. Um, but leg, hip, trunk, body, and then if you look down here to the bottom right, um, the mouth is very sensitive. So a large portion of the sensory cortex is tied to what sensations you have from these parts of your mouth. So this is Mr. Homunculus. And how much of your brain is dedicated to each part of the body? Cool. Number four. I think today's gonna be a quick class video. I'm excited. Pain. There are two types of pain. There's intense stabbing danger pain. When something is seriously wrong, a bone is broken, you have been stabbed, right? We call that the fast pathway of pain. When there's an emergency, your brain uses the thickest possible nerves. Nerves. What does myelinated mean? Lots of glial cells, lots of su support, lots of insulation, so that the action potentials in these afferent neurons can get to the brain as quickly as possible. A delta fibers. I think of them as being like A plus fibers. Really good, really strong, the best way to get the message to the brain, okay? So your A delta fibers are huge, thick, insulated fibers to carry important messages. Now, sometimes we also have aches and soreness, okay? 
that type of pain, not as serious, those travel on the slow pathway. They would go on smaller fibers, um, smaller nerves, because those signals aren't as important to the brain. All right, so again, the more important the signal, the thicker the myelin sheath, the protection, the insulation of those axons and neurons, okay? A delta, those A plus fibers travel the fastest, okay? When you take a painkiller, usually a, a painkiller, you know, medication, Advil, Tylenol, usually it's better at blocking slow pain, right? These signals aren't as powerful. So Tylenol or Advil might stop the aching and soreness that you or your parents might feel in their joints, knees, back pain, especially, right? Whereas if you have a broken bone, Advil, Tylenol, if you've been stabbed, not gonna make much of a difference because the signal, the pain signal is so strong. Now, there's a theory that we can do something else to help with pain. There's a theory that we can sort of distract the brain and the spinal cord, right? The central nervous system, all those nerves travel up your spinal cord to the brain stem and into the brain. There's a theory that the spinal cord kind of has like a gate. Only so many signals can get into the spinal cord, can get up to the brain. So there's a theory of pain, put a star by it, gate control theory, that if we send other signals to the brain, it might prevent the pain from getting up to the brain, okay? Um, we can block it. So uh, I love this little graphic here. We got a little, we got a train station. It's the brain train. This has brain up here. We have the gate here and you might have pain trying to get to the brain and you can maybe block it maybe with medication that blocks pain or maybe other sensations, right? Um, perhaps, uh, are you all familiar with acupuncture? Okay, this is meant to help pain. So what we have here is a person who they're putting needles into the skin, into the pain receptors around the body and it's such a strain sensation that it takes over the spinal cord gate. So if you have back pain, knee pain, elbow pain, chest pain, uh, folks have pain from other issues with the body, it's like the needles kind of distract the brain. The needles, they get to the gate first so that the red pain can't get through, okay? Um, Y'all know this sometimes. If your leg hurts, sometimes you will punch your arm. All you're trying to do is you want the less bad arm pain since it's closer to the spinal cord, you want it to get to the spinal cord first to prevent the knee or leg or foot pain from getting to the brain. That's gate control theory. Only so much information can get up to the brain. Check for understanding. I got four questions for you. So, so far, see if you can answer these. If you want to pause it, try to answer these. We'll also talk about them in class. Moving on to the last two, the chemical senses, smell, the fancy word for smell is olfaction. Say olfaction. So ways to remember this. Um, sometimes people think about an olfactory being smelly, olfaction. Um, maybe you just think about old people. For me, when I see the first four letters in olfaction, I think about Olaf. Do you want to build a snowman? Do you all know Olaf from Frozen? Olaf has no olfaction. What do I mean by that? He has a carrot for a nose, so he can't smell, right? The way smell works is you actually have these receptors in the nose, little hairs, not your nose hairs. These are like nerve hairs that hang down from what's called the olfactory bulb. The way a light bulb hangs from the ceiling, these nerves are in the nose, and when specific chemicals get breathed in, when molecules are in the air, they go to the olfactory bulbs, and that connects directly to the limbic system. We mentioned this. Remember, all other senses go to the thalamus, thelma, the sensory switchboard operator, making sure that signals get to the right spot. Smell is unique. Smell is hardwired, literally, by the olfactory bulb directly into the limbic system. So when the chemical gets into your nose and it triggers the olfactory bulb receptor protein hairs, that, that, that sense goes straight into your, your memory, your emotional center, okay? Um, so it's connected to the hippocampus. 
That's why smells can bring back certain memories. I may have told y'all about, I, I had that ex-girlfriend that had that particular kind of perfume. And if I ever am like out and about and I smell this perfume, <gasps> ah! it brings back these memories because smells can be tied to your past experiences because it's connected straight to the hippocampus. You can feel afraid, right? You can feel fear based on certain smells. You also have good memories as well. Now, anosmia over time, if you're sick, right? One of the symptoms of COVID-19 is losing your sense of taste and smell. Well, that means it's a problem with maybe the olfactory bulb or the receptors in your nose. When your nose is stuffed up, the molecules literally can't get to the olfactory bulb because smell involves actual chemicals. Meaning, uh, if you smell chocolate, there are little bits of chocolate in your nose. If you smell roses, molecules from the roses are in your nose. If you smell gross things, if you smell fart or poop, it means bits and pieces of those gases are actually in your nose triggering those smells, okay? So smells very powerful. Sometimes though, you'll smell something, you'll be like, I've smelled this before, why can't I name it? Why am I having so much trouble thinking of what the object is that the smell came from? The reason why, well, it's because unlike all your other senses that go to the thalamus and then to the cerebrum, up top to the cerebral cortex, Smell is unique at going straight to the midbrain, straight to the limbic system. So smell sometimes has difficulty connecting with your thoughts and with those neurons, those feature detectors, right? That, that vision might pick up on and trigger. So um, smell, such a powerful sense, uh, but it is unique for that reason. The last sense I want to go over is taste or the fancy word for it, gustation. Say gustation. Right? If you've taken Spanish class, the phrase me gusta, right? We translate that as I like, but in reality, gusta means to have a taste for. I have a preference for, I have a taste for this thing, okay? So gust has to do with taste. Do y'all recognize this guy? Have y'all seen Ratatouille? What's the chef's name in Ratatouille? His name is Chef Gusto, which literally means chef taste or Chef Tasty. What a brilliant name for a chef, Gusto. Just like smell, taste requires actual chemicals touching your sense receptors, which in this case are the papillae on your tongue, okay? Um, these can be damaged by acids, hot foods, smoking, alcohol, but they can replace themselves, especially while you are younger. So if you burn your tongue, and you're like, oh no, I can't taste my food anymore. Don't worry, you know, y'all are teenagers, those things will come back, they will grow back. So you have different types of papillae. We'll talk about them in class, where they are, what they do. Um, this is a zoomed in version. This is what your tongue looks like. These are the receptors that are in charge of taking in and activating when certain proteins are sensed on the surface of your tongue. Now, when y'all talk about taste, oftentimes you get taste mixed up with flavor. So taste is the sense that's on your tongue. Flavor, what you think about when a meal smells so good, tastes so good, they actually say that 90% of what is taste is actually smell. So watch a little video clip in class about um, taste and smell. Um, some folks, you know, there's different types of taste. This is the one they like to ask about. So make sure you write down, say, umami. Umami is the taste of proteins. So meat has an umami taste. Um, chicken, but also other proteins like tofu or edamame or beans or nuts. Umami is proteins, okay? Sweet, sour, salty, bitter. Um, they used to say that different parts of the tongue um, had different receptors. In reality, you can taste most things on all parts of your tongue, um, but when you are uh, drinking a new soda or when you're eating a delicious food, if you do swish it around in your mouth, you are activating more papillae, different types of papillae in your tongue, and therefore it'll trigger a stronger sense of sensation. And it's also why when you're sick, things don't taste as good because smell is such an important component of flavor that if the chemicals can't get to the olfactory bulb in the nose, then you're gonna miss out on some of that brain flavor, right? Nothing really is real. Nothing really has taste or flavor. It's all in your brain, but these are the senses that are taking things in. So see if you can answer these four questions, a little check for understanding. We'll have a quiz, we'll go over them in class. Uh, appreciate you guys.
Um, if you take a look here at the unit three guide that's on E-class, we've covered all this stuff on hearing. Okay, we've talked about all these parts of the ear and vocabulary terms. We talked about a lot of stuff with vision, right? Two lectures, 38 terms that you should be familiar with, with vision, okay? Um, and now we've also talked about some of the other senses as well. We'll talk about pheromones in class with smell receptors, um, powerful smell. But make sure that you're looking at the unit three guide and starting to get ready for that unit three test. If you're watching this before Sunday, the 11th, make sure you've turned in your unit two test corrections to get that grade. Thanks y'all, see you later.